Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're so glad that you're all here. Um, I have the pleasure of doing introductions. This is one of that's one of the uh, the perks of, of I guess. Okay, so I'm starting. So I've been talking with Paul Reed Smith for a little bit, and so I'm starting to use musical terms. That's the perk of my gig, right? So. <laughs> Um, but, but it is, I, I, have, uh, I do have the honor to introduce some really, really uh, wonderful people this evening. Um, we do have some, we have many honored guests in the audience, but uh, there are a few that I did want to, um, to point out. We have the world famous Granger Brothers in the audience. Where, yeah. <laughs> We have Dr. William Nelson, who is the director of the Sidney Kimball Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. <laughs> um, Michael Hibbler, who is the Senior Associate Director of Development at the Sidney Kimball Comprehensive Center, Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. And I'd also like to introduce Jamie Mann, who's the president of PRS Guitars. <laughs> so we're here for the, um, for the Jones Seminar in American Business. And one of the things I really love about business is that you know, we treat it as a liberal arts here at Washington College, uh, that we see it as interdisciplinary, as a program where you can take many, many um, elements and put them all together and make something really special. And, and so our guest really exemplifies that. Um, our speaker tonight, Paul Reed Smith, um, has taken his passion for music and transformed it into PRS Guitars, which is a world-class manufacturing facility. And if you haven't been there, um, I just recommend. It's just marvelous what they do there in turning out these wonderfully high-quality uh, guitars. Um, also, um, Paul Reed Smith has uh, created a new business relatively recently. He founded a new company called Digital Harmonic. And this organization provides the mechanism for patients and doctors to take advantage of the insights Paul and his late father wove together to create a new kind of medical imaging system. In both instances, Paul's passion for music and innovation, combined with his desire to share these gifts, found their outlet in the creation of business. And that's why I love business. So we are indeed fortunate to have Paul Reed Smith here this afternoon as a 2016 speaker in the Jones Seminar and American Business Series. And please join me in giving him a warm Washington College welcome. I speak all the time at schools, and it, I'm, not, I'm more nervous than I have been ever, which I think is a good sign. Um, I named this thing that I wanted to talk about not just me. It's not just me, and we'll get to that, but I wanted to thank um, Sheila Bear and George Spillich for doing this. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of people that I love that are here. There's a lot of family, there's a lot of personal family, a lot of business family, there's a lot of Washington College people here, and, uh, and I want to thank you all, thank you all for coming. I'm s south of Mason-Dixon line, I'm allowed to say y'all, I know we don't think we're from the south, but we are. And um, I named this, it's not just me, and I'm going to get to that later, but um, there's going to be a lot of that as it goes along. And, so when I got the call from George about this honor, I had a lot of feelings. I had several reactions. The first one was I felt very touched. I thought it was great. And the second one was, oh no, Dr. Smith is the lunatic from Lost in Space. That's not good. Because when I grew up, Dr. Smith was a nutball. He screamed a lot. He was always in fear. He was just a disaster, always wrong. And so all of a sudden, I was going to be Dr. Smith, and I was like, oh, this is not good. But I got over that, and I called George, and I said, thank you. And 
so then I got to, well, well, what's this in? What's this doctrine in? He goes, public service. And I went, thank you. I think that's good. Um, thank the board for doing this. I really appreciate it. And I called him back in an hour. I said, come on, George, let's change it. Let's make it physics. How about math? How about industrial design? How about graphic math? Because the guitar maker's taken up every part of the guitar and rotating his head like SolidWorks and doing graphic math all the time. And my son, Samuel, who's here, explained to me that math is taught three ways. It's taught algebraically, it's taught, math, uh, it's taught numerically, and it's taught graphically. And in my house, algebra was a nightmare. I was screaming arguments. I, could, I didn't understand solving for x, but oh my god, if you wanted me to look at something in my head in any dimension, that was easy. But I didn't understand that was math, so I didn't think I got the math gene. But it looks like maybe I did, and so I said, come on, George, let's change it. So you said, that's not possible. It's the board has said public service, and I'm going, why public service? I say, okay, George, I get it. I teach at Washington College often. That's public service. That's me and Gary and Greg doing public service, right? Okay, George, the guitar company is world famous. And it's a huge public relations, public service job. So maybe it's okay because of that. All right, George, artist relations, all these guys are public figures. And I have to deal with all these public figures. Maybe that's public service. Okay, George, I teach at Bowie, we teach at Washington College, we teach at Gemacy, we teach at Longreach, at the Anne Arundel County School Systems, at Severn, at Severna Park, at St. Mary's. All right, so now I'm starting to get it. Public service is right, it's correct, it's perfect, and I'm wrong, and I, and I loved it. I started to love it. I thought, I actually started, and then I thought, I have the biggest Rolodex I've ever printed out, single-spaced, it's three-quarters of an inch deep of paper. That's a lot of people to deal with. And my father was very afraid that I was going to be a guitar maker in a shop by myself and not learn how to deal with the public. And he never, he said, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that you would actually have to deal with so many people. I thought you were going to be a hermit in the shop which was why he was so scared about me being a guitar maker. He wanted me to be a mathematician like him. But I was, but he, we didn't understand that. I wish he was here right now to tell him all this. I think he would eat this up, by the way. My father was here, it was great. By the way, my mom's here. Right there, there you see, my mom's here. So, mom, you've raised three kids, right? Anne Marie's a doctor. Ch Charlie's a doctor. And now you're going to have a third doctor. <laughs> I think that's a good job raising kids. So um, at one point, a sage came to me and says, You know, the greatest thing you do for the world, Paul, I think, forget the guitar making and parenting, that's all good, but. I think the best thing you do for the world is provide 250 people with jobs. That's public service. I thought it's just still making sense, right? So why is it just not me? So at Washington College, it's George and the whole school and the Grangers and me and everybody coming here to teach. That's not just me. In the guitar company, it's 250 employees and all the past employees and Warren, the chairman of our band, and, and Jack, who's been running the company forever, and Jamie, our new president, and Beverly, and Lauren, and everyone at PRS. We're all together. It's all one thing. In artist relations, Bev, we got her crew. At Bowie Senior High School, it's Sally Burns and getting permission from the school for me to come teach there every year. At Longreach, it was Foster Driver and him convincing the people in the school that I wasn't nuts and it was okay for me to touch the kids. Or at Genesee, which I just spoke at, it's a learning, uh, um, tough learning environment school for kids. Wow. It was extraordinary to teach there. I'm now convinced that intelligence level and learning disabilities are tied together. These kids were brilliant. They were just brilliant in some areas and missing a little bit in another area, right? And I thought that was cool. Um, we've got the band. We're out. We went to China. And when we went to China and played, 
These guys, these people in China, these, these women, these men in China, it was like the first time they ever saw a rock band. It was like being in America in 1967 and seeing your first concert. That's, that's public service, right? Um, Carlos Santana uh, telling the world that they need to pay attention to us. Or John Mayer is blowing up the internet right now about, around our guitars or our dealers or distributors or all the press that Judy's doing and just all these world famous people that are helping the company. It's all of us, it's not just me. So then I got this family support thing going on too. So it's not well known, but my father sat with me for a week every night in my house I went back and we drew out the entire assembly line for the, um, for the factory together. And then he helped with the whole computer system that we started the company with. Um, my mom was the first one to say, you know, maybe this guitar making thing's okay. She believed in it. There was a moment in my house where I was leaving to go get a, give a guitar to Ted Nugent. She's under the table handing me as many 20s as she could get out of her wallet so I could make it there and back. Um, this one's going to be hard. My brother Jim, who I lost, we all lost last year, drove to my house 30 times at least to pick me up to try to tell me that I had something special going on in my life and that he wanted to see it happen. That was very powerful for somebody to say, hey, there's something going on here. You need to take care of this, Paul. Um, my brother Bob stood up for me when other people had, and, and my sister Anne Marie was, is a, we're on the phone constantly. It's just constant. My brother Charlie, which this is not well known, helped me make guitars upstairs in the Bowie house all summer long. And at the end of the summer, he helped me make this big pile of guitars and said, you want to be a guitar maker with me, Charlie? He goes, no, nah, I think I want to be a doctor. I'm done. <laughs> and he went on to become a doctor as Anne-Marie did as well. We didn't invite you to help build those guitars with us, did we? Sorry, I'm, I apologize now. <laughs> she's got lots of really bad stories which she's gonna tell at dinner tonight, we'll see. Um, and then, you know, with my wife Paige, there's this hourly, daily, constant support system that I have. And my f first wife, Barbara, helped start the company. You have gotta give her the nod for that. And with Sam and Sarah and William and Christine and Jonathan, my children, and there's lots and lots of stories about it, but my Christina came home one day. She says, I'm sick of it, Paul. I said, what's wrong? She goes, every day they follow me around and ask me for a free guitar at high school. <laughs> and she said, and my brother Jim used to get so mad at me. He says, I'm more famous for being your brother than I am for how to... He used to run the BET uh, truck and be the head engineer for NPR. And he was more famous for being my brother. He was furious at me about it, right? I was just doing my job. I'm sorry. So anyway, it's not just me. It's been huge amounts of people. And so I was wondering, why do, why do all these people help? Why do they help? And I realized it's really the American dream, right? It's this kid in Bowie who decides to do something in his bedroom and turns nothing into something, and all these people want to join and turn nothing into something. It's really the American dream, right? And I got a lot of love from family members and a and people who became family who are not, I mean, Greg, I'm sorry, you and I are family, but we're not family, but we're family, right? Sorry. No, yeah. Sorry. That's just the way it is. Um, and so the truth is we're all on a train that left the station a long time ago as a team. And so the company provides me and the people at PRS an opportunity to be philanthropic. We raise money for Hopkins every year, and it gives me a chance to teach young people. It gives us a chance to teach students. It gives us a chance to take the guitars with little teeny dings on them and sign them and give them to charities, and nobody in the charity, they're all appreciative, but the dealer wouldn't take them, which is great. Um, and it also gives me an ability to have an income so the kids can go to school, right? So there's so many things that the company 
does that helps all of us give back. Because in my world, you know, where's Samuel? Where's my son Sam? There you go. That's my grandson right there. Um, Samuel's my son. His job is to not listen to me. His job is to have his own ego and his own place in the world. So my hope is if I give to other people, someone else will give to him. You know, I'm trying to pay it forward, right? And it's, it's true with all the kids. So how many students do we have here? All right, so now I'm going to talk to you guys. I want to show you. You, th you think the way it is now is the way it's going to be, but that's not the way it works. So I'm going to show you some stuff up on the screen, all right? All right, here we go. This is going to be fun. All right, here we go. All right, that's my mother and father getting married. Look at the look on his face. He's the cat that just ate the mouse. <laughs> he knows he is lucked out. You can see it all over his face. Not bad, right? That's not bad. I love that picture. All right, so here comes the next picture. Come on, baby doll. There you go. So that's Bob and Jim and my mom and my dad and me right after I, was, after I was Benjamin's age. So here comes the life. Here comes the second family, right? And I'm sorry, everybody looks pretty happy. All right, let's go on. Here we go, come on. That's me. That's before your soul has a bunch of poo all over it. That's before, that's when you're happy when nothing bad's happened at first grade. That's a good day, right? All right, here we go. Yeah, I know. That's good. That's, you look like me, Benjamin. It's good. Don't worry about it. All right, hold on. All right. That's me on the left. I don't look like that anymore. All you students, you're not going to look like this anymore. <laughs> That's a hippie. I'm wearing some carnation. This, and I'm, once again, it's not just me. That's Russell playing guitar. We were in the bars in Annapolis learning how to play guitar. And I'm sorry, I look like a cocker spaniel. It was, <laughs> and now I got a yarmulke. It's different, right? <laughs> All right? Hold on. I know, I know. It's okay. Hold on. So here's dad, and I'm trying to explain something to him, and he's listening with all his heart. He wants to really understand what's being said. I had a little more hair then. It's gone. This lines. You guys, this is all going to happen to you guys. Hang on a minute. So this is Gary and I, the first time we came to Washington College to teach. This is us starting to teach the way we teach music, which is some sort of combination of rhythm, harmony, and melody, right? And this is the beginning, Gary, of us, of, of us doing this. And it was a good moment. And this was the beginning of this thing you saw, George, right? This is us coming to the school. All right, so now I want to go back to Dr. Smith. You've got to remember that Dr. Smith was a bad thing when I was growing up. That was not a compliment, and I'm going to show you why. All right, so basically Lost in Space had this lunatic named Dr. Smith. And here we go. You bubble-headed booby, do you realize what you've done? 
I was on the point of landing on the Isle of Capri. Now I'll never get there. Silence, you ninny. I do not recommend sleep, Dr. Smith. Oh, go away, ninny. Go away. Ah! Out of my way, you ninny! It cannot be a statue of you, you bumbling bird brain. Your opinion of me is not shared by those who erected it, Dr. Smith. <laughs> Remember that, Anne Marie? Do you remember that stuff? Wow. So, <laughs> I'm sorry to make fun of it, but that was my second feeling when I saw this, right? And they're teasing me as I'm walking out of the factory today. They were teasing me. Oh, the Dr. Smith jokes are going to be nonstop, Paul. They're going to kill me. But I think it's an honor. I think it's good. So, let's go back to the giving. So, now we get to give back through Hopkins, right? Michael and Bill, we've done all this raising of money and raising of money and raising of money. It used to be we would make $20,000 and then $40,000. A few years we made $400,000 net, net, net raised for Hopkins, right? And then Bill Gates gave you guys $20 million and I felt like a nothing. And Michael goes, no, your, your half million was good. You shut up. <laughs> um, and we started a new company with these ideas that came from my father and from... Bill and Michael and the idea that PRS was making these devices that mechanically were making harmonics and we figured out there might be a way to digitally measure these harmonics and turns out that harmonics are the, a constant in the world. Um, and there were some very, very famous people in our building today and we've been invited to speak at MIT as of today, which is really cool, which I need to tell you about tonight. Um, but there's some really good things going on, and Scott Haggis, who runs Digital Harmonic, is here. Where's Scott? Where's your hand? There you go. Hi, Scott. And uh, Shane Morse is here also, who does all the engineering uh, for it. And we've got a way to maybe be able to lower the radiation in mammograms or to be able to measure sonar better or maybe... Um, have an impact on uh, cybersecurity for this country and a lot of other things. And, and we've started this new company and something else came out of the relationship of us raising money for Hopkins. We started another company out of it. You never know how it's going to go. So that's, in, in a way, I'm talking to the students. Sometimes you just have to pull on the string and things come out of the hole you never thought were going to come out. You know, you thought you were going to get a frog and out comes this big... Uh, groundhog or something. You just don't know. And sometimes you just have to pull on the rope and, and you know there's something good at the other end. You know, that's just the way it works. And you just never know what's going to happen. But your gut said this is a good thing and you should do it. And my experience is that's a way to live in the world. You know, that your gut said this is a good thing to do. This is my new friend and I'm going to have an adventure with this new friend. You don't know where it's going to go. You have no idea where it's going to go. Um, I've got a lot of MICA graduates that work for me, these art graduates, and they spent 10 years working in the factory and didn't understand that eventually that their art degrees would apply to guitar making, and now they're running private stock, and they've changed the entire color palette of the guitar industry from their art degrees. They didn't know. They didn't know how it was going to fly. They had no idea. So... With love in my heart and to my wife Paige and all my children and my stepchildren and my nieces and my nephews and my grandchild and the extended wives and the girlfriends and boyfriends and the fiancés and the extended family and all our employees and our industry peers and the Hopkins people and the Washington College people, I want you to all know the following thing. I wouldn't trade, let me change exactly where I'm going to put this, I would trade this honor in one second away if I knew it would help anybody's lives in this room or the extended room. Just like that. I, would just, I wouldn't even think about it. Now, thank God I don't have to do that. But my focus is so that if it, I can help in any way or I can 
help my personal business family in any way I will, I can, and I'll make the time. And my experience of my extended business and personal family and the Washington College extended personal family is that our priorities are all in order. We'd all do that. And I think that's good people. I like being in Maryland. I find that quality in this state a lot. And um, so I, I, I think that uh, me making fun of it with Dr. Smith and all that is all in order and, in, and okay. Believe me, my employees are going to be making fun of me for this for a long time. And I'm sure my kids haven't even started, right, Sam? No, okay. So I was asked four questions, and this is once again for the students. How did we as a group make such good guitars? That was the question that you asked. So it started with a very small group of very determined people with a common goal. That was one. And I was the teacher. I was the guitar-making teacher. And it was a whole group of experts working together to try to get this thing to happen. And what we do is we fix problems, and then we fix problems, and then we plan, and then we execute, and then we fix problems, and then we fix problems. So that's how, um, as a group, we were able to make good guitars because there was a teacher and there were goals and there was a, a way to do it. So then the second question is, what were the obstacles that we encountered? So there were three major recessions. You had one in the early 90s that almost took our breath away. And then there was a guitar recession. Remember Jewel and all the women were playing guitars on the radio? You couldn't give an electric guitar away during that period. We had an electric guitar recession. It was really bad. And Carlos Santana and Creed came back and held the guitars up, said, nope, electric guitar is back. And Carlos got all his Grammys and we were off to the races again. And then the last recession was really hard. The last one for the last eight years, breaking even, was doing well. And that's not, that's so, much, not so much fun. We also moved the factory. That was a real obstacle. We had to move it from Annapolis to Stevensville. And when we did it, I called Ted McCarty, who had run Gibson from 1948 to 1964, I guess. And I said, well, you've moved factories lots of times. What are you going to encounter? And I thought he was going to tell me how to move the move the machinery or how to make the guitar or how to do this or do that. He goes, Paul, you're going to get really angry. Keep your cool. <laughs> okay, and it happened. Something really pissed me off, and I walked away and kept my cool. I, I thought it was very good advice. Um, another obstacle we have run across is that our electric guitar industry was invented in the, between 1948 and 1964, and there were a lot of codes that were made to then. How do the, how do the old pickups sound? How the guitars were made? Um, how uh, f the Fender went about it? How did Gretsch go about it? How did Martin go about it? How did Gibson go about it? How did all these companies go about it? And cracking those old codes has been very, very difficult. It would be like being a violin maker and you want to make violins that were as good as Stradivarius or Guadagnini and having to study them and having to crack the old codes of what was the old man thinking and how did he make the instruments. It's not such an easy thing to do. Also, we've had to keep our artists and market very happy. Um, is Bev here? Where's Bevy? Hi, Bev. Artists get unhappy and the market gets unhappy really quick, doesn't it? Right? Just like that, they went from happy to not happy, and those are obstacles that we move every single day. Um, so those were the obstacles we encountered, and then my wife said, well, that's not enough. How'd you get through these obstacles? And so I've been taught that you somehow you muddle through. Somehow you work really hard and you look for a solution, you look for a solution and look for a solution, you talk to experts and you enroll experts and you find solutions, you stay at it and you stay at it and you stay at it and you stay at it. So do you remember in 2008 when the, when the economy took a dump? We had stored wood away for 10 years waiting for a rainy day. So what we did was we built, in less than two weeks, a wood library, and we put all the wood out that we'd been hiding, and we invited the whole world to come with a bad economy. And damn if they didn't come and fly to us and go through the wood and order lots and lots of guitars. So we 
had a solution, which is, okay, you won't just order guitars regular, we'll show you unbelievable wood, give you a good deal and you give us an order, right? So those are the kinds of solutions. And the look on my employees' faces when I said, you have to have it done by next week, wasn't the nicest look I ever got. But I told them they were flying from Japan to do it and they worked all weekend. And those are the kinds of solutions that make a, a, a big difference when you're trying to get around obstacles. So an obstacle is a, ro a rock in the road, and somehow you've got to either get around it or move it. And it happens constantly. Um, so, I, I mean, I got story after story after story. I'll probably tell a couple more, but that's really what it is. Life is this whole idea that you meet somebody and live happily ever after is a bunch of crap. I mean, what do they do in the biz Disney movies, the first thing in the Disney movies? Yeah, they kill the mother or dead, right. They kill off the mother or the father, that's right. That's exactly what happens, and then the kids got to somehow mature and become the dad or the mom, right? That's what The Lion King is about. Let's kill off the pop and see how the kid does. And somehow that's okay. So anyway... The next question you ask, so how do you recognize talents in other people? And that's a tough question. Um, you have to use your gut. You have to use your interactions with the people. You have to use your intuition. But in my experience, you look at their results. So the, the, the definition of an expert is somebody in a very, very complicated area that solves very, very complicated problems over and over again. That's the definition. And if you want to get through something, for all the students that are here, find an expert. Find somebody who's gotten through it before. Um, also, I've done a tremendous amount of therapy uh, for a variety of reasons, but I can tell you it gave me a skill to be able to read people. And when you can read people, you have an idea of how to recognize talents in them. If you have a talent yourself, it's easy to see the, that talent in somebody else, but sometimes you might, you might need a talent you don't have, and it's not so hard, but being able to read people and know what they're made out of or be able to ask the right questions to find out what they're made from is really important. It helps to know how people operate. And so I like people who see big. I don't like people that see small. I like to see people that see big. And I remember when Jamie Mann first joined our company, the first thing I did as I walked him through the new factory and he looked at me and says, do you have a layout? In other words, I want to see a schematic of how this thing's going to be done. And I thought that was thinking big. He wanted to see this huge new building operate as a factory. We were in a lawsuit with Gibson. By the way, you named this building Gibson. <laughs> you told her what I said? Yeah, good. Um, and... Um, I was on the phone with my lawyer, Bill Coaston, and I said, Bill, we had lost the first part of the case, and I said, Bill, can you get me out of trouble? In other words, can you win this case for me? And there was a silence on the phone for 45 seconds. I didn't say anything, he didn't say anything, it was just silent. And 45 seconds later he said, yes. In that 45 seconds he had to calculate how the future was going to go through a very complicated case. And I went, okay, let's go. Lawyers are trying to protect you from the past, they're trying to protect you from the moment, and they're trying to protect you from the future, and their job is to tell you how it's going to turn out, pretty much. And I thought that that was think, seeing big, that was thinking big. I thought what Bill did was extraordinary, that in 45 seconds he told me how the case was going to end. I was like, wow, I like this guy. That's, you know, to me, that's recognizing a talent in other people, right? So being sued by Gibson was another obstacle. I wouldn't recommend anybody have to go all the way to the Supreme Court to keep your guitar company, but if you got to do it, do it. And there was somebody in my final assembly, Rob Carhart, came up to me, and I remember we were trying to figure out whether we were going to just collapse in the case or we were gonna actually stand up and he got, Rob got right in my face, he said, don't you dare back down. Okay, I won't. The way he said it was so powerful, I knew at that moment we were gonna see the case to the end. That's thinking big. 
Uh, and I, I really like that. So once again, to the students here today, I want to try to give you a few lessons in life. A little bit of, and I know this has been a long soapbox, but hang on, I got a little bit more soapboxing to do, okay? I went and spoke at Gemesee School the other day, and one of these learning disabled kids looked at me and says, tell me what your number one best piece of advice is. I turned around, I kind of gathered myself and I turned around and I said, get a mentor. Find somebody that's been there before. If you want to fish the river, find the old man that's fished it for 10 years. He'll leapfrog you 10 years forward. If you want to be a writer, find a great writer to teach you one-on-one. -on -one. If you want to be a guitar maker, find a great guitar maker to teach you one-on-one. -on -one. If you want to be a, 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 a patent attorney or a, a, a litigator or a trademark attorney, find someone who's done it before. And I have a story about that. I used to go to these vintage guitar shows, and this one guy, Jimmy Wallace, would have a stack of $100 bills, and nobody else had any money. And I used to go, how come he's got all the money, and nobody else has any money? He was always selling, but nobody else was selling. And I knew he knew how to sell sand to the Arabs and ice to the Eskimos, and I didn't know how to do it. And then I went to Ralph Perucci, and Ralph Perucci could always, he was always selling something. Everybody's always giving him money. He was always giving them gear. And I hired those two guys to come to my trade show and run my booth for years and years and years because they had a skill. I wasn't raised in a house full of merchants. I was raised in a house full of mathematicians. You know, we would sing at, we would sing at Christmas time and go caroling, but we weren't selling anything to anybody. So those were mentors to me and, it, and if I couldn't hire them I would go sit in their office or do anything I could do to get them to teach me what it was that they had and I think that that's really important so while I'm still on the soapbox let me give you a few definitions I really like the definition of maturity is responds well to the world you have somebody who's responding well to the world, you're looking at a mature person. If you're having, looking at somebody who's not responding well to the world, it's not mature. And, and it's a good way to look at it. The next definition I like is of innocence. Innocence is a virgin to the world. Doesn't really understand how it works, right? I, definition of an expert, one more time, is somebody in a very complicated area who's solving very complicated problems over and over and over again. Now, this is, next one's not a definition, but it's a theory. And I believe people get angry when they feel violated. Does everybody agree with that? Pretty much, right? I mean, that's my definition of anger. Why does somebody get angry? Because they feel violated. They're pissed, right? You've got to worry about people that get pissed too fast and they weren't violated, but that's different. Um, so my experience is that when you clear out the pipe, when you're not upset about something, when you're, if you're not bored, and boredom is another uh, definition I like, uh, boredom is anger without enthusiasm. You're pissed, but you're not really enthusiastic about it, right? Um, is, that the, is that the standard definition of boredom, anger without enthusiasm? It is now. It is now. <laughs> um, I feel like when you clear the emotional pipe, all this love bubbles up. Um, I like the definition of courage, too. Courage is having love even though you're frightened. Having love for yourself even though you're frightened. Having love in action even though you're frightened. And the last one is one I've played with my kids. The last thing is a definition in a way. We always play this game called what's driving the bus. So the students, you ever seen anybody act really nutty? like non-linear, like they're doing something that just doesn't make sense. There's always something driving the bus. They're having some feeling about something. And I can't tell you how many times my kids and I have gotten in the room and gone, what's driving the bus? Somebody's, somebody's doing something nutty. Somebody's doing something that doesn't make sense. Somebody's doing something that looks completely out of bounds. There's always something driving it. And to be able to figure out what's underneath it for yourself what's driving the bus or other people helps you see clearer in the world. If you're driving a bus and you can see clearly what's going in front of you, that helps. So anyway, 
it's not just me, it's, and it's, just, it's not just me. There are so many people in this room that have contributed, starting with my mom and dad. By the way, if you hadn't had me, this wouldn't have happened. Thank you very much. Good job, Mom. Um, I brought two guitars. How many guitar players in here? Everybody who plays guitar can sit on those stairs and play those guitars afterwards. Those are my personal guitars. I brought them to share with people who play guitar. If you want to hold what I think are personal guitars, do that. Now, I'm going to show you something very interesting. I bring these guitars home to show my wife, Paige, where's Paige? Where's Paige? All the time. I say, look, Paige, isn't this beautiful? And I put it in the lights and the kitchen. She's like, yeah, it's really pretty. I brought this one home, and I put it in the lights. I go, isn't that pretty? She goes, I'll have that one. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Well, she didn't know this one I loved. <laughs> and I had to calculate the following things in a few seconds. One, if she died, I'd get it back. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> if I died, she'd get it anyway, right? <laughs> I'd have to borrow her guitar to go on the road every time I went to play. That's all right. She really did deserve it. Why did you take this from me? I like how it <laughs> Well, this is my wife's guitar, so you can play my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife's guitar. Now, I happen to still like this one more than that one, but that's a different discussion. A different <laughs> Any of you want to play me, dig it, I'll kill you. <laughs> So back to the students. Over and over again, I'm going to say mentors stay at it. Mentors stay at it. Mentors stay at it. Mentors stay at it. And the best teaching is done one-on-one -on -one in my experience. So did you guys see the Masters? Did you see Sergio Garcia win this thing? He said yes? All right. So he became my hero the other day. Why? He never, gave, he never won a championship. And here he's got a green jacket on, and he's won his first one. He never gave up, and the grace at which he spoke about the tournament and getting there was extraordinary. Normally, people are resentful. It's finally time I'm here. Rah, 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 rah. He didn't do any of it. It was all classy. And I went, I really like you, because he never gave up. He must have made thousands of adjustments to get there. And he had a good day on the right day. Right? So it's not just me. And for the students here, it's not just you. And I want to thank both of you and all of Washington College for the honor. Thank you very much. Very good. <laughs> That was fabulous. Thank you um, so much. You know, when you started talking about the crazy Dr. Smith, at first I thought you were talking about our first president, so I'm glad we got that clarified. <laughs> so, crazy? Yeah, no, absolutely not. I don't think so. He was a good friend of George Washington and Ben Franklin, so I think that probably, probably says something. So thank you, Susan, for hosting this, and thank you, Paul, for those are wonderful remarks. I'm so pleased to be part of this event myself to confer the highest degree the Washington College can bestow. It having been recommended by the faculty to the visitors and governors that Paul Reed Smith is an individual of unusual scholarship and learning and therefore worthy to receive highest honors. I have been authorized and directed in accordance with the ordinance to that effect to confer at the James C. Jones Seminar in American Business on April 13, 2013, Casa Honoris to Paul Reed Smith, the degree of Doctor of Public Service. This has been signed by the visitors and governors of Washington College and the state of Maryland. Let me now read the citation of the award. Poets and mystics have long understood the power of music to permeate the entire body, to slow or quicken the heart rate, and to heal a broken spirit. Paul Reed Smith, the legendary guitar maker whose instruments are famed for the quality of sound they produce, 
has launched an exciting new venture, mirroring art and science that proves the poets and mystics true. Through his company, Digital Harmonic, Mr. Smith and a team of prominent scientists and medical experts had developed, you're not a doctor yet. <laughs> Mr. Smith and a team of prominent scientists and medical experts had developed image and waveform technology capable of peering into the bodies, if not the souls of medical patients. Combining Mr. Smith's understanding of sound and harmonics with his father Jack's understanding of precision mathematics and physics, the proprietary and patented technology produces sharper x-rays while significantly reducing the amount of radiation exposure typically found with conventional medical imaging. So he's gonna make it things safer for everyone. Remember this term, precision measuring matrix, which extracts and analyzes waveforms and signals across time, frequency and amplitude to reveal information never seen before. This is 21st century innovation at work, revolutionizing not just the medical industry, but global defense sectors as well. Experts from Johns Hopkins Hospital and the US Navy have partnered with Mr. Smith to consider new ways to apply his company's algorithms to the respective fields. What Paul Reed Smith Guitars has done for musicians and musical performance, Digital Harmonic is doing for scientists and defense and analysts who rely on the most clear and accurate information available. If the solid growth and reputation of Paul Reed Smith Guitars over the past three decades is any indication, Digital harmonics will be a major player in driving new technologies for many years to come. We applaud this Maryland entrepreneur whose love of music has amplified our understanding of the world. In recognition of his significant achievements as an innovative and creative thinker, we are pleased to present to Paul Reed Smith the honorary degree, Doctor of Public Service. Thank you, we're done. <laughs> That's so sweet. You know, this, cho this is choking. It chokes you out, there's a little button there. You can <laughs> we'll get that fixed for you later. <laughs> no, I think that's the way it's supposed to be. It used to be a hood, right? Well, your wife can go like this when you get out of line, right? <laughs> <laughs> she does it now anyway. For everybody that came and everybody that supported all this, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you, you for doing so this. Thank you it's very well much. Deserved. Thank you. Very well deserved. Thank you. We are honored to have you as part of the Washington College family. And Susan, I'll turn it back to you now. Okay, so thank you all for being here and thank everybody who helped make this event possible, both at Washington College and at, at, at PRS. Um, we have a wonderful reception for you in the Underwood lobby, courtesy of Phi Beta Kappa. So please enjoy, thank you.